One thing I cannot give you is a recipe for getting out of a recession. If I had that, with great respect, I would not be standing here this morning, would I? <laughs> I'd be making an absolute fortune. The McKinsey's of the world are looking for the Holy Grail. This is how you get out of recession. And if anybody tells you they've got that recipe, tell them they're lying. They haven't. <coughs> Hopefully, all your companies will come out of the recession, and you'll all do it in different ways. Every person in this room will contribute in a different way to their company coming out of the recession. So don't go looking for the recipe. Don't read Jim Collins' book, From Good to Great, and say, which is the paragraph that tells me how to be great? Don't waste your time. It's not there. There's no shortcut. One thing for certain, it's not going to be easy, even for good companies, to get out of a recession. Let's go back a few years to when a lot of industries were stable. And what I mean by stable, if you're in a stable industry, you could do the same things this year you did last year, and the results would still come through. So change was doing what we've always done, just doing it a little bit better. And if you looked at any stable industry, if you go back far enough, airline industry was stable. Is it stable today? <laughs> No, it's a bloodbath. Automotive used to be stable. Is it stable today? You talk to the boards of GM, Chrysler, Ford. Do they think they're in a stable industry? No. Where's GM at the moment? Chapter 11. Where's Chrysler? Being bought by Fiat. I mean, how low can you get? Come on. <laughs> We live in a world where in five years' time, the big three will not exist. Remember the guy talking yesterday about the move, the center of gravity? Come on, who are the big car players of the future going to be? Tata? Some of the Japanese, some of the Chinese, Europeans? Falve, the great Falve, probably. It's, that's the sort of world we live in. You'll have seen this before. Companies going around the top of that curve spend an awful lot of time trying to do the right things. Companies going down the bottom spend an awful lot of time trying to do things right. Same two words in English, different order. I think they're a million miles apart in the way that people think about their business. If I looked at any one of your strategies, what I would want to see jumping out at me is what are the right things for your business to be doing to come out of a recession. Rough rule of thumb, no hard evidence for this. Your success as a business is probably 80% tied up in the right things and 20% tied up in things right. Of course, what the world-class companies want to do is the right things right. Please don't focus too much on this. Companies spend too much time measuring this. Why? It's easy. It's usually got numbers on it. Number of banks I've worked with in the past, and you say, well, what do you do? Oh, we are a relationship bank. And you say, right, how, how do you measure relationships? No, we don't. We measure transactions. But you're a relationship bank. Ah, but measuring relationships is difficult. Might be difficult, but if it is crucial to the existence of your business, make sure you're doing it. When you talk to your customers, when you talk to your clients, whether it's formal feedback or just conversations, be, be honest with yourself and say, what am I asking about? Am I asking about this? Or I'm asking about that. And particularly in a recession, that is your recipe. This is what my company is going to do. And it's only going to be three or four things that's going to take me out of the recession. If you've got a strategy that Stellenbosch Business School will give you an A plus for, 
and it's still sitting on your desk and you're still discussing it, it's not worth that much. You're better off with a strategy that's 70% right and you've got it up and running. Speed is becoming more important, particularly in a crisis, in a recession. Ask yourself, how fast does your company move? Some companies actually have a reputation for moving very quickly. Others don't. But there's an issue. If you want to move quickly as any organization, what price do you pay? What's the downside if you move quickly? Internally focused, what else is likely to happen? You'll make mistakes. So if you want to move quickly, there's got to be a very important characteristic of your culture, which is your attitude to mistakes. What's it got to be? Learn from them. If somebody in your organization makes a mistake, you chop his head off, you parade him around the company, say, this is what happens when people screw up, I guarantee you, you will move slowly. In periods of crisis, when you want to move quickly, you don't reward people for making mistakes. But if you make a mistake, let's understand why, and then we'll tell everybody else in the company, and nobody will make that mistake again and move on. It becomes much more important when you've got to get out of a crisis. So speed of movement is probably more important now than it was two years ago. Your ability to implement your strategy is more important today than it was two years ago. Bottom left, these are people in senior positions in a business with no management skills and no leadership skills. So clearly, this box is empty. We'll have a little joke about this, but only a little one. In periods of stability, these people are irritating, but no more. John Akers at IBM knew what to do with those people. If you were in that box, he would put you in an office with no job description, no secretary, and a disconnected telephone. <laughs> and if you were thick-skinned enough, you could live out your life at IBM, and John Akers could put his hand on his heart and say, we never made anybody redundant. In periods of change, I am afraid, ladies and gentlemen, those people are dangerous. They kill companies. They destroy organizations because the only item on their agenda is preservation of the status quo. A small number of people in that box can stand between your company and coming out of a recession. Now, having been so black and white about it, what do you do with those people? got to get rid of them. I don't mind how you do it. Send them on a world cruise. Send them to Harvard Business School for 12 months. It's probably a cheap way of doing it. Give you a phone number of somebody in St. Petersburg, slightly cheaper. <laughs> but you've got to get them out of the organization. And I want to draw a distinction now between difficult decisions and unpleasant decisions. Give an example. Cardpoint, the ATM company, we bought a competitor, a company called Moneybox. And what we wanted were all their ATM locations. There were 128 people worked for Moneybox. We needed eight. So the board meeting before we signed the deal. Question is, what do we do with 120 people? We fire them. Is that a difficult decision or an easy decision? It's, easy. it's dead easy. Because if we don't do that, the deal doesn't stack up. Is it a pleasant decision? No, it's horrible. And Mark Mills made sure every non-exec was in the room when we talked to every one of those 120 people and said, this is why we are letting you go. The stock market gave us a round of applause because we did it within 48 hours of making the acquisition. We could have said, well, let's think about it for six months. But you come back in six months, you've lost six months, and the decision is still easy, and it's still unpleasant. I think it's very important in times of crisis. People have got to be very clear the difference. Because I think 
the more you're in a crisis, decisions become easier because you have fewer options. They become easier and more unpleasant. But that's what your exco and your board are paid to take. Not easy decisions, they're paid to take unpleasant decisions. I think we need to distinguish between the two because it stops you moving quickly. So you've got to get those people away from the business. You must lead, you must be prominent. Don't believe if you've told your workforce once, they have heard you. You've got to tell them at least three times. It's not that they're stupid, it's just that that's the reality. The great Percy Barnevik, when he put ABB together, the Swedish company and the Swiss company, first thing he did, he went round the world and gave a 12-slide presentation to every one of his managers. And when he'd done it, he did it again. And when he'd done it twice, he took the same 12 slides, went round the world again and gave exactly the same presentation to exactly the same people. And academics give him nine and a half out of ten for that merger. And he said, that was the most important thing I did. He said, I could not delegate it because everybody knew it was my idea. He said, technology, he said, forget it. He said, useless. He said, I had to go to ABB India, to Mumbai, eyeball my Indian managers, look them in the face and say, this is what ABB means for you. So what that says is in a crisis, your top management your exco should spend much, much more time on internal communications within the business. The buck stops there. In a recession, in a crisis, the board of a company can't say, oh yes, communications is important, and then delegate it. Get out of the boardroom, get into the business, be visible, and make sure people know what you're talking about. If you make the changes, your competitors will worry about you. There's real, real first mover advantage, not just in product launch, but employment of technology, and what are we going to do to come out of a recession? First mover advantage, be proactive, let the competitors worry about you. I'm overrunning, but I've got one slide, which I must do because I think it's important. You might not find this useful. If you don't, it's just one more useless slide. Two sorts of organization. I, I, I got a fantastic job. I get to travel all around the world, talk to a lot of companies. I go into some companies and I say, what are you doing? And oh my God, they're busy. They've got so many projects, it, it exhausts me just writing them down. And I go back to the hotel room at night and I'll look at it. I think they're busy. They're doing nothing. It's the diet mentality. These are the companies that, that want the quick, they want the quick fix. These are the people who bought Tom Peters' book, In Search of Excellence, years ago. And they read it through and said, where's the sentence that tells me how to be excellent? It's not there. The book's rubbish. <coughs> Jim Collins, good to great, will go the same way. Because it doesn't say, this is how you can be great. Do you know, these companies, they are a consultant's dream. Any decent consultant can go into a dieting company, take three letters of the alphabet, select it at random, and sell it as a package. That's what they do, isn't it? They want to be successful. They're looking for the shortcut. They won't want the pain. Other companies are different. You go into reception. It smells different. The way the receptionist talks to you is different. The conversations you have in the company are different. And these companies, they're on a diet as well. But for them, it's nothing more than continual improvement. It doesn't really warrant comment. There's something special about these companies. They're not full of nasty people. But what they are saying is, if the environment and the market demands it, which it does at the moment, we are more than happy to go out into our market and behave in a very, very aggressive manner for two reasons. We think we've got the ammunition and somebody at the top says that is an appropriate way of behaving. The final question, I asked the chief executives I interviewed, 
all over the world, a lot of different industries. I said, is it possible today for you to diet your way around the top of the curve? And they said, it used to be, but no longer. Couldn't find anybody, any decent company that was going around there with a diet mentality. So do me a favor. Look at the business plan you put together. Look at your strategy and benchmark it against that. If you think it reads like a diet sheet, even if you're in government, throw it away and start again. Come up with something that reads like a battle plan. It's not guarantee of success. But if you only remember one picture, which is probably more than enough, remember this one. Is this your environment? If it is, your challenge, your company is what are you going to do that's going to take you around the top of the curve, maybe at the expense of your competitors. So you come out of the recession in prime position to take the next step. Dieting won't do that. Some of the stuff we've talked about and the battle plan, I think, is perhaps more likely to achieve success. So there's your challenge. Take your companies, please, round the top of the curve for the benefit of our South Africa. I have retired here. I have sold everything in the UK. I have come down to South Africa to retire and die. A long time in the future. Please don't tell me I was wrong. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah.